The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Nick Cortina here with another great Exago Lab for you folks. Now before we do get started, I'd just like to make sure that everyone can hear me and see my screen okay. So if you could just type a Y or a yes in the questions pane just to let me know that I'm coming through okay. Awesome, and we all know the drill. I'm seeing the yeses coming through loud and clear, so that is great. And so on that note, we'll go ahead and get started. So today's lab is all about configuring the scheduler. So the lab we did earlier this month was all about our end user scheduling options and the types of things we can do with the scheduler in the front end. Now we're going to talk about it sort of from the other side of the spectrum and what we need to do to get the scheduler actually installed, configured, and set up so that way we can take advantage of all those fun end user options. We'll also touch on a couple of the more advanced configuration things that we can use the scheduler for, particularly things like load balancing and some of those other items in just a second here as well. So what actually is the scheduler? Well, it's a standalone service that actually works in conjunction with Exago. Now, it's going to be used to schedule and potentially email out reports. We can also archive report output if we'd like. We can do remote execution jobs, and when we say remote execution, we mean when a user directly goes into Exago and clicks run report. We can obviously do schedule jobs here as well. We're going to be able to utilize our scheduler for report caching. So Exago does have a caching feature that will definitely improve some of our performance on some particularly long running reports, and the scheduler is going to be utilized for that. And finally, as I just alluded to, we'll be able to use our scheduler for load balancing. So for periods of high reporting traffic, the schedulers can be configured for load balancing to help performance in that regard. So for today's lab, we're going to talk a little bit about the installation process, what we need to do to actually get a new instance of the scheduler, how we would go ahead and actually configure that given scheduler, what we need to do there. And then finally, we'll talk about the administrative settings we'll need to configure for the scheduler. That's going to be in the admin console. And we'll do a little flip-flopping back and forth, and we'll sort of turn on some settings, and then we'll go to the UI and see how they actually affect what the user will be able to do at that given point. Finally, before we get, go any further, I do just want to mention our next lab is going to be on July 11th. That'll be all about formulas in ExpressView, so be sure to stop in on July 11th for more information there. And so on that note, we'll go ahead and get started here. And so one of the first things that we'll have to do if we want to take advantage of scheduling options in Exago is actually just download and install the scheduler. Now, as many of you folks are aware, when you actually go to the Exago support site, you can sign in, go to the downloads page, and click on the most recent version to get a download of the actual Exago application. And when you open up that download file, you're going to see something like what we see here, the Exago setup application. Now, if you've gone through the web application installation, you'll know that you go through this process, you select some given file locations, and you install the web application. But using this same Exago setup application, we can actually install the scheduling service here as well. Now, a couple things that I want to make a note of before we go any farther. The Exago web application, the scheduler, and if applicable, the Exago web service API all need to be on the same version. Now, anytime we update any single component of Exago, we'll also have to update the other components as well. So regardless of whether we choose to update, whether we stay on the same version, whatever the case might be, we need to make sure that any and all three of these items that we're leveraging are all on the same version, or we might see some unexpected behavior. Another thing I want to mention here is that our scheduler, or potentially multiple schedulers as we'll see in just a moment, don't actually have to be on the same server as Exago. And having dedicated server resources for a couple scheduler instances can actually be really beneficial in terms of performance. Having dedicated server resources just for those scheduled or direct execution reporting jobs can really help periods of high traffic and ensure that we're dedicating enough resources to ensure that we're seeing good performance there. One thing I will say is that if we're not going to install the scheduler on the same service as Exago, we're going to want to make sure that we expose that scheduler over an open port that's accessible by the server that the Exago web application is running on. So with those items in mind, if we wanted to actually go ahead and install a scheduler, we would select the bottom option here. 
and it's going to say, hey, this is our Exago Scheduler Setup Wizard. This is going to guide you through the steps required to install the Exago Scheduler Windows service on the computer. It's going to make a mention to disable our antivirus software. If we don't do this, when we start going through this process, you might get a little notification saying, hey, do you trust this source, right? And, you know, the answer there would be yes. Um, however, we definitely recommend disabling the antivirus software just when going through this initial process. Now, when we hit next here, we can see that we can actually select an existing scheduler service if we just wanted to update the scheduler installation. But we could also go ahead and hit new scheduler service here and that would allow us to provide a service name and additionally pick a file location that the uh, scheduler service will actually be installed to. Now, once we're content with those settings, we can hit next. It's going to say the scheduler is ready to install here. We can hit next and this will actually begin the installation process. Now, I've already got a scheduler configured, so I'm not going to install this one again for right now. However, after the install is completed, I'll navigate to my Exago lab folder. We'll get a new folder, and in this case, it's just called Exago Scheduler. But one thing I want to mention here is navigating into this folder, we're going to notice this Languages folder. Now, if in the Exago web application, we've either modified or added any custom language files, those language files need to be copied over to the languages folder here in the scheduler installation. Additionally, you'll notice that there's some compiled DLLs in this folder as well. Now, these are all the compiled DLLs that the Exago web application is also utilizing. If for some reason we've included any compiled DLLs or assemblies in the bin folder in our Exago web application, those same DLLs need to be included in the scheduler's base install folder, as you can see with some of the DLLs that are already included here. Now, once we've gone ahead and made sure that the install went through correctly, we've copied over any language files we might need. We've also copied over any compiled assemblies we might have. We'll then next be going into actually start configuring some of our scheduler settings and we're going to do that by opening up this eWebReportsScheduler.xml file. When we open this file, we're going to see a whole collection of settings here. And for the purpose of the lab today, I'm going to briefly run through all of the settings on this page. and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on some of those that are more critical to getting the scheduler initially set up. Now, on that note, if you do want more uh, deeper information on any of the different configuration options here, be sure to check out some of the scheduler documentation on our support site after the lab. So starting from the top here, particularly because the scheduler is used for a lot of our emailing report options, one of the first things we'll have to do is provide the actual SMTP server that we're going to use to email out given report output. By the same token here, we've also got this SMTP enable SSL setting. And if we set this to true, this is going to use secure sockets layer. Now, this is generally something that's going to be dictated by your SMTP server. You'll also notice that we've got our SMTP user ID and password. So this is going to be the user ID and password combination that's used to log into the SMTP server so we can be authenticated and then eventually email out report output. We've also got our SMTP from field. This is the from email address that's going to be used in given report output emails. We have our SMTP from name. This is just going to be the name that's going to be added to those emails and say from this given name. Next, we have our error report to. Now, this setting is the email address that's going to receive error reports when something doesn't go right with the scheduling service. In general, this is probably going to be your Exago administrator's email so that they can see information about when certain errors or other things might be happening with the scheduler. Next, we're going to come to our channel type. This is either going to be TCP or HTTP, and that's just going to be dependent on the actual channel type that the scheduler is exposed over. We also have our port number here. Now this is going to be the port number that the scheduler service is being exposed over as well. 
The default port we use here is 2001, but again, if you configure different open ports that you'd like to expose the scheduler over, you can certainly configure that. You'll just need to make sure that that port number is included here. Next, we have our working directory. Now, this is actually going to be the folder where all of our scheduled documents and temp files are stored. The default, as we can see here, is actually just going to create a working directory in the scheduler's base install location. We have our default job timeout here. This is the maximum number of se seconds that a report can execute for. And if it goes above this given maximum, an error report email is going to get sent to the error report to email that we just saw on line 9. Next we have our sleep time. This is the time interval in seconds that's used to dictate how often we're going to pull our different schedulers to pick up reports to execute. We have our simultaneous job max here. Now this is the max number of given jobs that the scheduler can execute concurrently. And this is really going to be dependent on your server resources. So the bigger and beefier that this, uh, the server you install the scheduler is on, the more potential reports that you can allow your schedule to execute simultaneously without seeing sort of a slowdown in the performance there. Again, that really is just going to be dictated by the amount of resources that the server the scheduler is installed on. Next, we have logging. Now this dictates whether or not the scheduler's activity is logged. When on, the scheduler is going to push this information to the eWebReportsScheduler.log in the base scheduler installation. If I open up the scheduler installation here again, we'll see this eWebReportsScheduler.log file and that's where all that information is going to be sent. Next we have our flush time. This is how many hours before either completed, abended, or aborted jobs are automatically cleared in the Schedule Reports Manager. A value of zero here would mean automatically flush those jobs as soon as they finish. And the default here, negative one, means never automatically flush those jobs. Our sync flush time here is the flush time for synchronous or non-scheduled reporting jobs. Our email addendum, this is going to be the text to add to the body, of, or excuse me, the end of an email body. And this is generally a, going to be a good place to add things like various disclaimers or other content that you might want to include in your given report emails. In the email addendum, we can actually add a slash n like so to include a new line in the addendum that we create. Our external interface setting is an optional way for us to utilize a specific external interface just for scheduling options instead of the external interface that may be specified in the Exago web application. Our report path is what's going to be utilized if we don't want to email a given report output and instead include a folder location here where we would save that given report output for later consumption. This is generally what we'll want to use if we have reports that are handling sensitive data that really shouldn't be emailed out over the internet. A bend upon report error, if set to true, is going to set uh, a report job to not finish that given schedule if the report errors on execution. Instead, that scheduled job will be set to abended. Now, if we actually set this to false, the report will continue its execution and the, the status of the schedule is going to remain as ready. Our IP address here is the binding IP address for the scheduling service. And really, this is most commonly going to be used when the server has multiple network interface cards. Our security protocol is where we can specify which security protocol to use here, if applicable. Encrypt schedule files will be set to true to encrypt all files created by the scheduler. Now, if we have some pre-existing scheduler files already set up, and then we go ahead and set this setting to true, the next time the scheduler service is restarted, all existing scheduler files will then go ahead and be encrypted. We have our max temp file age here. 
and this is the number of minutes between each flush of the scheduler's working directory. Our default here is 1,440 minutes, and that corresponds to 24 hours. But one important thing to note here is that our temporary files that are included in this working directory are used during our report executions. So making this value too low can result in some erroneous behavior. And as a result of that, we would definitely recommend not making this setting anything lower than 60 minutes. We have our email retry time. So if for some reason an email fails to send, this is the number of minutes that we're going to wait before going and trying again. After five failed attempts, the job will be automatically be set to aborted. And finally, we have our queue service. So this is the path for the optional scheduler queue. And we're going to touch more on the scheduler queue a little later on in the lab today. Now, once we've gone through all of our configuration settings and gotten the scheduler set up just the way we'd like, we'll actually have to manually start the service the first time the scheduler is installed and configured. Now, on Windows, this will be done via the services menu. So we'd go in, we'd go ahead and find the actual scheduler service. We would set that status to run by either starting the service or setting it, uh, its startup type to automatic and restarting the machine. Now on Linux, this will be done by running the start service script that's going to be included in the base scheduler install. And from there, we can actually add that script to your init scripts to ensure that it's actually running every time we restart the server. So next up, we're going to start moving over to some of the UI options that we'll be able to enable and the various scheduler settings. But before we do jump over to that piece, I want to just pause for a moment and make sure that there's no questions here. Um, and so we did have a question come in. Does this have to be on a Windows server? Um, as I was kind of just alluding to, we don't have to include this on a Windows server. If we have a Linux server, we can also install the scheduling service there as well. Um, we'll just have to make sure that we're using the appropriate installer. And actually, for just a moment for clarity here, I'll go to the Exago support site. I'm going to sign in with some of my credentials just so we can see some of the downloads on the page there. And if I navigate to the downloads page, we'll see that we can access the application installers. And if we go ahead and click on one of the applications here, we can actually install the Windows download or the Linux download. And both of those will include both the Exago web app, the web service API, and the Exago scheduler. Um, I'm also seeing a couple questions about in the config for Exago, there's two hosts, schedule remoting hosts and uh, synchronous remoting hosts, and I think that might be referring to the direct execution remoting hosts. Um, can the same service be used for both of those? Um, we're going to touch on that piece in just a second here, so I'm going to pause on the answer to that question just in the interest of what we're about to cover. So I think at this point, it seems like we're probably about ready to start looking at some of the admin settings in the Exago administration console. Now, before I get there, I do just want to navigate to the Exago uh, full UI here for just a second. Now, without any scheduler settings enabled, we're going to notice a couple things. First, on our left hand side, we have the options to create reports. We can browse our reports. We've got our data tab. If we were in a designer, this would be enabled. But you'll notice that the schedule reports manager currently isn't here just yet. That's something that we're going to have to actually enable before we'll see that option. Additionally, if I click in and we'll take this employee sales report. This is the report I was using on the end user scheduling lab. If I right click here, we're going to notice that I don't see any of the email or schedule options here just yet. Again, those are things that we'll still have to enable in the admin console. So kind of starting from scratch here, if I navigate to the Exago administration console, I've opened up my scheduler settings here for us to take a look at. The first thing we're going to have to do here if we want to use any of our scheduling features is enable report scheduling. 
Now, when this is false, we're disabling all scheduling options altogether. And if we set this to true, we're going to enable scheduling, but we can still use a lot of the settings down below here to get more fine-grained control of which scheduling options we actually want to expose. The second option here is show report scheduling option. So if we want users to actually be able to right click on a report and click schedule this report, we're gonna to need to set this setting to true. So with just those first two settings is true, enabling report scheduling and showing the report scheduling option, I'm going to apply those changes to my admin console here. And I'm going to refresh the full UI and let's take a look at what changes we now have access to in the Exago full UI. So if I, I go back into my lab content folder, scheduling, I'm going to click on this employee sales report again. And this time if we right click, we'll see that we've got another option here to schedule this given report. If I click schedule report, we can input a schedule name. And I can pick my export type. I can set an optional password here if I'd like. I could set this to execute immediately or pick a given schedule time. We'll notice I can set a given recurrence pattern and I can set the range of recurrence here as well. Now, for the moment, I'll just set this to execute immediately. I'll be able to go and modify any filter components or anything I might want to add to this report. But you'll notice that these are the only two tabs that we currently have access to. We haven't actually enabled the email schedule options just quite yet. So at this point, I can hit finish to f actually save this schedule. And we'll get this little notification saying that it's scheduled. But an important thing to notice here is I can't actually go modify that given schedule yet. Without the uh, uh, manage schedule reports option here, I'm not going to be able to change any schedules I create. I can set them up once, but that's really all I'll have access to. Additionally, we notice that I didn't have any of those email options. That means that the scheduled report is only going to be saved to that given report archive. So with some of those things in mind, let's navigate back to our admin console and take a look at the next batch of settings here. So this first one or a third in the list, I should say, first of this batch, is show email report options. Now, we can set this to true, but this is actually going to allow a user to directly email a report output from the report tree. If we want that user to actually be able to schedule a report to be emailed, that's going to be one of the settings that's a little farther down in the list, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So I'm going to set this one to true. And the next setting we'll see here is the Show Schedule Reports Manager. Now, this is what's going to allow us to actually view or modify existing report schedules after they've already been created. In the interest of being able to do just that, I'm going to set this one to true. We'll see we've got Show Schedule No End Date option, and this is what allows us to set up a schedule that will just execute on and on for, you know, however long we want it to go for. We can set this guy to true to enable that option. And then we've also got show schedule intraday recurrence option. This is what will allow a user to make schedules that execute more than once per a given day. I'm going to set this one to true. And now with this new set of settings here that we've just applied, let's save those changes. I'm going to go back to the Exago UI and refresh. And now let's go take a look at the modifications we see with that round of changes. So now I'm going to dig back into the lab content folder in scheduling. And if I right click on employee sales, we've now got this other option for me to directly email this given report output. I can input a given email here. We'll see my personal Gmail account. And I can go ahead and select the export type that I'd like to send off to that email. The other thing we'll notice now is that I'm actually going to be able to access the Manage Schedule Reports here. And if I go and click this icon, we can actually see the report schedule that I created just before. If I'd like, I can click this Edit icon here. And we'll now see that I'll have the ability to go and modify this given schedule that I had already created. 
If I uncheck my execute immediately checkbox here, we'll now see that on the schedule time, I can actually set this to repeat every so often using that intraday uh, recurrence pattern option that we added in the admin console. The other thing we'll notice is if we set up a recurrence pattern here, we have this no end date option. So if we do want this schedule to go on and on indefinitely, we can certainly set that up to do so here as well. Navigating back to our, the admin console here, we've got our, <laughs> and I just saw a question come in, ask Nick if he wants us to email him at Gmail. <laughs> um, maybe don't do that. <laughs> but uh, here we've got our scheduler manager user view level. Um, and here we can say that the default here is going to be the current user. That means when the user goes and accesses that uh, schedule reports manager, they're only going to see their given schedules that they've set up. But we can actually set this to be all users in the current company. And what that'll do is it'll set for this user, it'll look at the current company ID parameter value that's being set. It'll go ahead and look at all the other schedules and show this user any other schedule that's been created that has that same company ID parameter value set. The final option here is going to be all users in all companies. And that means that this user would be sort of your power or administrative user and that they get to see all of the given schedules created via the scheduler in Exago. The next one here is going to be email scheduled reports. Now, this is the setting that will actually allow us to enable scheduled report email options. As we recall, before we showed report email options, but that was just for those direct executions from the report tree. This email scheduled reports is what's actually going to allow us to set a given report schedule to execute however often and actually email that output off to some given set of email addresses. I'm gonna set that one to true. And then our next setting here is going to be enable batch reports. Now, we'll set this to true if we want to enable the batch reporting tab in the schedule reports wizard. Now, an important thing to note here is that we really should only be enabling this feature if we actually have the right setup for batch reporting. And by that, I mean, if we've got some given data object with a specific field that contains email addresses that we'd like to actually send a given report output to, that's going to be a case where enabling batch reports might be a good idea. If that's not something that we've already got set up in terms of our data structure, we won't want to enable the batch reporting as it's not necessarily going to be something we'll be able to effectively use. We've got our schedule delivery type options here. Now, if we set this to true, this will actually allow our users to select whether they want to email a report or save it to the archive. Now, one other important thing to mention here, if the delivery options is set to true here, the email schedule report setting is going to dictate the default behavior for emailing a given report or archiving a given report. The last thing we've got here is use schedule, use secure scheduler remoting channel. Now we can actually set this to true to ensure that we use a secure connection when remoting to the given scheduler service. Now before we go any farther, I'm going to apply this next set of changes. I'm going to go back to our Exago UI. I'm going to refresh the page. And if I once again open up this lab content, our scheduling folder, and our employee sales, I'm going to right click here and hit schedule report. And I'll set this to execute immediately for a second. I'll set up another new schedule. We can again still modify our filters. We'll now see that we have our batch reporting options set here. We could click right here to enable the batch reporting. Again, we saw some of this in the end user uh, scheduling lab. And once I finally get to this recipients tab, we'll notice that I now have the option to email the results. and. Just as a quick refresher, because that email scheduled reports is true and our show scheduled delivery type options is true, the default is for that box to be checked because we've set email scheduled reports to true here. Now, if we did still want this to go to the archive, 
we could simply uncheck email results. We'll notice all of our fields here are going to gray out and we could hit finish and then the schedule would go directly to the archive. Again, if we wanted to email it, we would just leave this box checked and we could go ahead and input a 2, CC, BCC. We could include a subject line and modify the body of this email as well. Navigating back to the admin console here, and this is where we're going to start to, to speak to some of the, uh, you know, the configuration components and tie back to some of those things that we included in that uh, scheduler configuration file. Our schedule remoting host is where we actually input the location of the given scheduler that we'd like to access. So as you can see in my little example here, we're going to have to include the channel type the actual server location, and then finally the given port number. Now we can hit the little lightning bolt here and that's going to check the given connection when we see connection to TCP colon slash slash localhost port 2001 successful. That means that we should be all set up to access that given scheduler. Now another thing to note here is this is where the load balancing component of the schedulers will begin to come into play. If we hover over the tooltip here, we'll notice that we can actually input multiple given scheduler servers by using commas or semicolons to dictate when the end of a given scheduler uh, location is. And so as a brief example, if I had another scheduler, say over port 2002, I could go ahead and include them in a comma separated list here. And now, as scheduled reporting uh, jobs come in, the first scheduled reporting job will get assigned to the first scheduler in the schedule remoting host list. The second job would be assigned to the second scheduler in the schedule remoting host list, and so on and so forth if we had more scheduler instances here. Exago's default, as I'm alluding to, is to use a round robin style of job assignment. Now, on that note, we can actually use a custom scheduler queue if we liked the ability to make a more informed decision about where to assign the next scheduled or remote execution reporting job. I'm going to speak to those items more in just a little bit. We've got just a couple other settings I want to speak to before we get right there. Moving down our list here. We've got enable remote report execution. This is what allows a scheduler to do a direct report execution in the Exago UI. When we set this to true, this means we'll be able to use that scheduler when a user goes in and just says run report. Next, we've also got our enable execution cache setting. This is what allows report executions to be cached via the scheduler. So reports can be run during times of low traffic, and then the output can be brought up near instantly for users who want to see it. A really good sort of use case for this is if you have reports that have millions and millions of records that need to be processed and maybe some complex calculations and things of that nature, it might make more sense to set up that given report's cache to execute nightly. So that way when the user comes in bright and early at nine in the morning and they execute that given report, Instead of hitting the data source and doing all the processing in, again, they'll just get to see the given report output that was generated previously that night. And again, we'll have the ability to modify how often the cache for that given report is created, so that way we can ensure that the data is never getting too stale or anything of that nature. On that note, we also have the user cache visibility level. Now, this is what dictates the visibility permissions that a user will have for given execution caches. At user, this means that that user will only see cached output that they create. Company will mean that a user can see cached output for anyone else who's executed and created a cache with a matching company ID parameter value. And finally, global means that that user can create cached output for anyone else to consume. We've also got enable access to data sources remotely. 
And what this is going to do is allow non-execution based database calls. So anytime that we're just getting the schema, uh, maybe we're getting things like filter values or anything of that nature, those given calls can be executed on a different server via the scheduler if we feel that that might help improve performance. Another thing we'll notice here is our remote execution remoting host. Now this is going to be very similar to the schedule remoting host here. We can actually dictate a given scheduler to be used for given schedule remoting hosts or to be used for remote execution remoting hosts. Now just like above, if we want given remote execution or remoting hosts to have multiple schedulers here to be used for load balancing for the direct executions when users are coming in and clicking run report on demand, those given schedulers can be included in a comma separated list here. Again, we'll just have to include the channel type, the server name, and then the actual port that we're exposing the given schedulers on. Like the schedule remoting host, we'll be able to use the lightning bolt to test that connection. So if I were to take this guy and move it down here, we'll see that the connection is successful. Now, we've talked a little bit about that load balancing component and how we can add multiple schedulers for either schedule remoting host or remote execution remoting hosts. And as I mentioned earlier, the Exago's default is to assign jobs in a round robin style of job assignment. That said, we can actually create a custom queue service. And with this custom queue service, we can do things like inspect the available server resources, and that'll allow us to make a more intelligent decision about where to assign the next given reporting job. For those of you that are familiar with the custom assemblies we might be using for folder management, it's going to be a very similar concept in that we'll design a custom compiled assembly with all of the appropriate methods and things that we'll need in order to actually use the custom queue service instead of the default Exago uh, job assignment. Now, we do have some great examples of the scheduler queue service on our support site, as well as some documentation, including all of the relevant methods and things that we'll need to replace if we'd like to use this queue service. So if you do want more information in there, be sure to check out all the supporting documentation on the Exago support site. Next, we're gonna have delete schedules upon report deletion. Now, if we set this to true, this means that we'll automatically delete any schedules that are associated with a report that has since been deleted. We also have our default email subject. So this is just a default email subject that will be applied to any given scheduled report jobs email. Very similar in nature, we have the default email body this is going to be the default email body for any given report output email that we might generate. And one thing you'll notice I've done here is I've input this C attached report and I use the parameter syntax to say report name. And as we may have noticed in the Exago UI, this actually makes it so that in each given scheduled report body, it dynamically populates that with the actual name of the report that I'm going ahead and scheduling there. We're able to use other visible parameters that we include in our Exago admin in the email body here as well. So if we do have some other parameter values that for whatever reason we feel would be appropriate to include, we can do so here by using the syntax uh, with a starting and ending at sign and then the parameter name. The next thing we've got here is our password requirements. If we recall in the schedule report wizard, when we're on that recurrence page, we can set this password that we want to, that we want someone to actually have to use before they can access either a PDF or Excel output. However, when we're designing this password, we can actually set up a list of requirements that you know might do something like require an uppercase letter or require a certain number of characters. Now, the given options that we have here are using a capital A, which dictates an uppercase letter requirement, a lowercase a, which dictates a lowercase letter requirement, 
we can use a lowercase n, which requires at least one numeric character. And we can also choose to include a numeric value here. And that means that the password has to have at least that many characters. So as an example, using the password requirements that I just typed in, this password would require one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, one numeric character, and at least six characters total. And we could certainly have multiples of these if we wanted. So if we wanted two capital letters and maybe two numeric characters with a minimum of six characters total and at least one lowercase character, we might have something like this. Finally, we have the option to include a custom scheduler recipient window. Now, into this setting, we'll actually have to provide a custom URL as well as a height and width for that custom scheduler recipients window that we define. Again, that's one of those extensibility components that we can choose to implement if we'd like to go ahead and design our own custom scheduler recipients window. I would say that we're not going to dive too deep into that for the lab today, but we do have a lot of great documentation on that on our support site, so be sure to check that out if you'd like more information there. Now, at this point, that's going to bring us to the end of the prepared content we've got for the lab today. Um, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Please feel free to post any remaining questions in the questions pane. We'll be sure to stick around for another couple minutes to make sure we get answers to all of those. And as always, happy reporting. muted. unmuted. Hey, so we did have a question come in that I feel would be appropriate to answer for the group. And the question was, where is the report going to sit if we archive it? If I navigate back to the eWebReportsScheduler.xml, the configuration file for the scheduler, we're going to see we've got this report path setting. This is where we would input a given folder location. And that's going to be where given report output would be archived if we're not electing to email the given output. Hey, Nick, one more question came in here sort of as a follow up to what you're saying. Uh, and that's to ask what if you're using custom folders? And by that, I think they mean folder management. So if you are archiving schedules, uh, you would specify a report path here. It would likely be a location on the file system. Uh, and then the external interface, the line just above that, 
uh, has a method that we can call to notify a code handler in your application to say that the file has been saved and then that file could be moved, loaded into a database. Uh, really, you can manipulate it from there as you choose. So that's how you would take those files from the server, move them as you need, or notify the user that they could log in and do 